Our, our next speaker um, is possibly well known to you all from uh, previous API Days um, conferences. So Mark Boyd has been part of the API Days community for quite a while. Uh, Mark is a is a an analyst and uh, founder of uh, Platformable, and uh, Mark has been responsible for writing a lot of uh, uh, presentations. Um, uh, sorry, a lot of reports around the open banking platforms uh, and other types of platforms happening around the world. Um, the state of open banking, I think, is a series that Mark has written uh, in the past and and updates every year. Um, so uh, Mark is Mark is a, an Aussie who has made Europe his home, uh, living the dream, and uh, Mark is here to talk to us about APIs, open ecosystems, and the emerging future. So please help me welcome to the stage Mark Boyd. Hey, Saul. Hey, welcome, Mark. Great to be here. Um, I'm just checking that my screen is working. I'm opening my presentation. I see. So if you, uh, yep, that? that looks like it. Oh, great. Okay, cool. So get into it. Shall I start? Yeah. Hey everyone, so my name is Mark Boyd. I use the pronouns he and him, uh, and it's great to be here with you all. Thanks, Saul, for uh, welcoming me back to API Days Australia. Um, and before I start, I'd like to pay my respects to Aboriginal elders working across Australian communities today. Okay, so our talk today is going to be on open uh, ecosystems, APIs, and the emerging future. Before we start, I would like to thank my team. Um, um, uh, so yeah, as Saul was saying, I'm Australian. I was born in Wollongong, uh, and now I live in Barcelona. And uh, you know, be and lucky to have a really great uh, international team working with me on a variety of um, open ecosystem projects. Okay, so open ecosystems. What is it? Everyone loves a slide deck that starts with a really long quote that's quite complex to understand. So uh, I thought I'd follow that uh, that that trend. Uh, and here, really, what we're saying here, or this handbook of digital innovation is saying, is that things are changing rapidly, and we're actually introducing globally a lot of uh, digital infrastructure that's going to be able to drive how we interact how we connect so out of this definition just pointing out a few things you know industry uh, is changing so the whole vertical uh, idea is sort of breaking down and you get some you get players working across different industries we've seen this recently with covid we'll talk about covid a little bit at, uh, throughout this um, presentation but for example um uh, mobile uh, telephone operators have been essential with helping with health infrastructure because they've been able to track population movements, which has then been able to help identify where we've needed to globally needed to focus on hotspots and be able to introduce new health measures. So there you can see like a, tel uh, a telecommunications company is working across a range of different um, industry groups. And you can see that in any industry. We've got a few more examples. It's also introducing this dynamic complex. So relationships are quite different between government, industry, uh, nonprofits, the and the community more broadly. Uh, and also this this issue where the infrastructure that the companies are actually contributing is also then going to be the digital infrastructure that we're all using. So you can see this with a player like Stripe, where in a lot of countries in low and middle income countries, Stripe is becoming the payments infrastructure uh, for that country, which then, so as well as competing in the country, it's actually becoming the infrastructure itself. And what does that mean around regulation and their role in those markets? And then also finally, there's sort of new forms of like collaborating and competing that we're seeing amongst all of these industry players. And we'll talk through some of those uh, new types of relationships uh, that, uh, that have been asked to businesses. So 
one example where you see this, probably one of the most advanced areas globally is around open banking. And so here you can just look at as at mid of this year, there's pretty much every continent around the globe is moving their um, payments and banking infrastructure towards this digital um, system. And, you know, there's a whole range of regulations that are sort of trying to shift um, uh, shift banking to be a digital infrastructure globally. And what that will mean will be that, that you know, it's been pushed because the idea is that if it was a digital infrastructure, there's a greater opportunity to build new products and services. Um, and ideally, a lot of the a lot of the driver globally for uh, for this sort of open banking regulation is to create new consumer choice. So it's sort of saying that when you have banks, they're locked into being able to just, uh, the banks sort of run the financial services infrastructure. When you move to open banking and digital infrastructure, then it allows a whole new range of players to enter the market and um, provide sort of more uh, differentiated services. Okay, so therefore what we're saying with an open ecosystem is it's made up of the stakeholders, it's the relationships between those stakeholders, and it's the infrastructure that they need to be able to co-create, collaborate, complement and compete uh, with each other. Okay, and what we say um, at Platformable, how we describe an open ecosystem is it's a network of equitable participation opportunities that allow the stakeholders you know, all sorts, governments, regulators, associations, industry, um, business, researchers and all and community and individuals to co-create, collaborate, complement and uh, and or compete with each other by using APIs and digital infrastructure. So there, I think one of the key words is equitable participation opportunities. So the move towards digital uh, infrastructure should actually enable everyone to be involved. So if we go back to looking at that open banking idea, not only does it break down the uh, the bank's uh, dominance over the uh, over the banking and financial services industry, which has in the past locked out certain uh, populations, then you know the idea of moving to a digital infrastructure is that it should be easier for startups to be able to enter and compete against incumbents, and also that you should be able to get this level of um, uh, digital service delivery that is then going to be able to target new products on particular populations and invite them in to being able to use the infrastructure rather than some of our um, more traditional systems which marginalise uh, certain um, uh, parts of the community or certain industries. Okay, and then there's a really great piece by uh, Ken Lane from the, uh, the API and Evangelist where he's talking, he's got a long list here if you look it up, it's um, early this year, 11th of January, on his website, apievangelist.com, where he goes through a lot of the different um, breakdown of the API or of what it means to be open. And there's a whole range of different um, criteria he uses. Okay. So, uh, and our definition, we're drawing on a whole range of work. So, uh, just let, so, you know, we've done the reading, so you don't have to looking at, you know, this move towards open ecosystems. Okay, let's talk about two examples in particular. Let's go back to open banking. First of all, I want to run you through what it looks like. So with gut, so governments here on the bottom left-hand corner, uh, so governments might tell a regulator, we want open banking regulation. It goes through a consultation process. The um, open banking regulation is introduced. In this case, the banks then are building their APIs and they may draw on standards bodies to be able to build those APIs in a standard and consistent way. Um, and then those APIs are released. Now, how well those APIs create value for other um, stakeholders will depend on the developer experience of those APIs. So how easy they are to um, use the APIs and integrate into um, new products and services and in the level of security because the security creates the consumer trust as far as using digital products in the end. So the level of the, um, uh, so we see these as value enablers that will then drive the amount of value that comes from the APIs into the rest of the ecosystem. API tool providers and consultants generally tend to help at this stage. So they'll help the banks develop the 
APIs. They might be contributing things like their API design, um, lifecycle software, security software, and the rest. So then through that, then comes the API consumers. So out of using the bank's APIs, you have aggregators, you have marketplaces, you have fintech building new products. And those sorts of new products will then go to serve a whole range of different um, uh, population subgroups uh, and parts of society. And here's where that equitable participation also comes in. So it should be, uh, there's the equitable participation for this level where the fintech can enter the market. And then there's the equitable participation at this level where, you know, if we're moving to uh, open banking systems, then the underserved, the unbanked should be able to get access to a new range of di digital services that they weren't able to in the past. So that's um, that happens in low and middle income countries, but it also happens in, in high income countries, including Australia, uh, Europe and the US, where there is a good like 20% of bank users who don't have access to a full range of the sort of financial services that they should be able to access. You know, things like alternative financing that isn't going to have uh, crippling fines that are going to impact on their future financial health, um, ways to be able to have a look at insight around their budgeting and their needs. You know, all of those sorts of products um, generally haven't been available to them under the traditional banking system. And now that should be available under an open banking uh, digital infrastructure. And then there's the other consumers, individuals and households, sole traders, small businesses and enterprises. So each of those are going to be drawing on a number of fintech products that are built specifically for them. Um, and then they're going to be able to then uh, increase their financial health, uh, ease the level of uh, of um, interaction that they've got to do. So there's no more waiting in bank queues. Um, there's more instant um, uh, facilitation of financial services and so on. And then out of that, there should become these ind indirect beneficiaries as well. So society should benefit because it's just more seamless and it's easy to do things and that there's greater opportunities for everyone to be involved. The economy should benefit because things like fintech are able to um, employ more people and pay more taxes because they're able to generate new um, uh, revenue. And the environment should benefit because uh, the, the uh, optimization of the systems should mean that there is less resource waste around um, how these systems function, less paper even. Um, but also what we're seeing with the environment benefits is now that we're moving towards this open banking ecosystem, there's a range of fintech players who are actually creating new uh, environmentally friendly products. So, for example, in fintech, uh, what happened first was that there were budgeting apps that were able to help some of these end consumers better understand and track their expenses. But now what's happened is that the, a lot of those uh, 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 budgeting apps have now also been able to do carbon ca accounting. So they're able to, so people are able to see how much their expenditure is creating a carbon footprint, able to compare that with others, and then able to sort of look at how to reduce that. <clears throat> okay, let's look at uh, one other uh, ecosystem. This is open health. And we're really here, we're looking at health data. This is some work we did with World Health Org Organization um, uh, during this year. So first of all, here you've got the data sets, <coughs> excuse me, um, that are about other people, organization, society, and the environment. They can either be from the health system or outside the health system. And then that flow of data gets you know, managed by sort of data stewards. Um, a lot of this thing is connected via API. So data organizations are pulling in that data. They've been share they're processing that data. Then they're sharing it via API with a whole range of industry players, uh, research, healthcare industry, even media. Um, and then again, the standards bodies, regulators are all influencing how that's done. Uh, and then underpinning this on the right, there's a whole range of data governance and API governance processes that help make sure that this is a sort of, uh, that there's a flow of trust in this system. Um, and then the once this data has been processed via API, um, and then it can come back to being shared in ways that generate and create new value. So for example, analysis, dashboards, um, it can be used as the raw ingredient in your medical device 
uh, considerations in um, uh, looking at uh, variants for uh, COVID. We'll come back to that as an example. The So, that you know, there's decisions that can be made out of this flow of data that's all enabled by APIs. And then out of that, then we're seeing that there's some value that's created for um, the individuals in broader society, a bit like how, a bit like the uh, indirect beneficiaries here, um, but here they're sort of by the direct and indirect beneficiaries. So better health outcomes because you can do more personalised health care, reduced inequality because you can focus more activities on those with the greatest health need, uh, optimised health system because you can do resource allocation better, and so on. Okay. So there's our open ecosystems. APIs are really central to how those, uh, those, the sort of emerging future of digital infrastructure is playing out. So we've got, again, let's go back to having a nice long definition that can, that you have to sit there and sort of read. Um, and then, you know, APIs, set of functions and procedures to enable creation of applications. What we say is that APIs are the connectors that link systems together but they use a clear contract on what can be shared between those systems. So the um, uh, access and permission controls are baked into the API. The agreement between the different players and the relationship is formalized via the API. Really grateful to Medi Medjao is thinking around um, this role of APIs to, that's really guided our thinking. Okay, so the three types of APIs. Now, I would say in an open ecosystem, it doesn't mean all APIs have to be open, you know, uh, and freely available in that system. You'd need to have some guardrails. You need to have uh, APIs that are going to have specific uh, relationships between them. So here, you know, open APIs are publicly exposing informational functionalities between that can then be used as the standard unit in different systems. So in open banking, for example, in Europe, uh, in Australia now, Banks are required to make payments APIs and account information APIs available for free so that other uh, fin so that fintech can build new products and services that integrate those APIs. So the APIs themselves are free. Uh, the, the fintech still have to be accredited to be able to demonstrate that they're um, responsible and have the security technologies in place that if they did integrate the APIs, for an individual customer account that they could manage that data or the functionality securely without introducing fraud, without introducing data breach risks. But the APIs themselves, they're open to anyone to use as long as you know, as long as you can be an accredited um, provider. But you could test out building with them without having that accreditation. And then if you're trying to go to production, that's when you need the accreditation in place. So there is, so you know, like that's their. That's the approach with the open APIs. The partner APIs, and then also just another point on this, is we would then say that you can also have open APIs that are priced. So there with banks in that open ecosystem, you can have um, open APIs that are freely available under regulation. They're required for banks to be able to make available in order to in in increase that consumer choice. But then banks can also then have premium APIs that they make available to select um, uh, fintech that they want to work with, or maybe it's open to everyone, but you've got to, uh, you've got to pay for, tra you know, a transaction fee for use of the API, or maybe they're looking at using those open APIs so that they're only available to customers um, to be able to do uh, things for, for for a customer account. So for example, uh, if you wanted to do a uh, look at uh, financial exchange data, then you can uh, build that into your ERP and your um, uh, enterprise resource planning systems. But to do so, you've got to be a customer of the bank to make use of that API. So it's an open API. There are limits on who's available to use it or the costs of using it. But we would still, I would still consider that like an open API, uh, open, it's just a degree of openness. And then you have partner APIs where they might not even be displayed or catalogued publicly. Uh, here you can see partner being represented by two people doing an elbow bump. Um, the, and here, a partner API is when there's that relationship between different stakeholders where they've entered into an agreement to be able to share uh, share data across systems or share functionalities 
across systems. And there the API might not be publicly exposed. You might not even know that two businesses had a relationship and were sharing an API. Um, but that, you know, but so then, you know, that one sort of less open, we'd say a partner one. And then there are private APIs behind the firewall or within an organization that are much more about like driving some of that discussion that we just heard um, in that last presentation where they were talking about, you know, dev, DevOps processes and speeding up, accelerating uh, the, the level of development internally. And there, you know, it's the, Inter the APIs are enable enabling that velocity internally by being able to um, uh, share data, build once in composable systems that can then be used for to break down a monolith into microservices. So you're not you don't just have to use one of these as well. You know, uh, it's not a matter of like each one of those is individually so we see within government we did some work where we um uh, developed the api framework for digital governments for european uh, commission and out of that we were noticing that governments for example you do various things with the apis and they have a ha they have multiple roles in this system they may have open apis that they're sharing data or they may or maybe partners between different levels of government um, where they're sharing data Internally, they might have private APIs where they're creating um, a form filling API that's used across multiple government departments to enable citizens to, or business to fill out a form easier, more easily. Uh, they may have partner APIs that they're working with uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence to be able to ingest large amounts of data and make that available to researchers to better understand what future digital government services or how to, how to uh, run city planning. For government, we also see an additional role, uh, and we've seen this with open banking, where they may set regulatory standards as well. So, for example, um, in uh, Australia under the um, uh, consumer data rights um, uh, legislation, then there's rules around how an API, how a banking API should be uh, templated and provided so that it's being used by different industry players. So, you know, sometimes there's this uh, variety of roles that can be taken. And also we've said here, you know, often these private APIs, it's that prerequisite, it's that first step before you're opening APIs to, uh, to, to, um, uh, to stakeholders more broadly. Let's quickly talk about the stakeholder, uh, the relationships between the different uh when you're looking at the apis here are what i want to really try to get home is that um the, it's not just simply about compete if you remember when we started we looked at that digital innovation new complex relationships between different uh stakeholders so here you know you can co-create with apis that example i gave of the for, uh, foreign exchange rate system in real time uh, businesses are able to co use that API to co-create, to think about when to move money in real time. So it's not really a competitive relationship. It's using the, the data or the functionality that's provided by the API to co-create. You can collaborate. I'll talk about this a bit later. But, you know, some of the work around COVID has really brought together different players to be able to uh, provide data in new ways. Complement. So here it's where you see a lot of the um, software as a service tools will have an integration marketplace. So they're not competing against, you know, a CRM will have an invoicing tool that's integrated into the CRM. They're not building that um, that tool. Them, they're not building the invoicing tool themselves. They're connecting via API so that they're complementing their CRM to be able to extend to new functionalities. Um, there is, of course, the traditional compete. So different um, providers will all provide will all make a payments API available, and you know then business is going to choose which one of those uh, payments APIs to use, and then they're going to coordinate. So then there's the option to um, uh, work together. You see this where um, stakeholders are being involved in standards. So again, it's that issue of like the stakeholders helping build the infrastructure, and in this case, building out the um, uh, the regulatory standards or being involved in those discussions, which then drive the um, uh, the use. Okay, just to finish quickly on measuring the value. So, okay, we've got the uh, open ecosystems, we've got the APIs, we understand the relationships between the various players. 
what do we want to measure in that sort of open ecosystem? First of all, we want to make sure that we are achieving that regulatory goals that we wanted. So if an open banking ecosystem is about making sure that there's advanced consumer choice, we want to make sure that the new open banking system isn't repeating the marginalised approaches of the past and putting and locking some sectors of the community out of opportunities. So, for example, here you could actually do some work where you're looking at the open ecosystem and you're asking who has access, what are the consequences, who's participating. So you're able to sort of look at that sort of level and really drive into where those um, where the where the open digital infrastructure is supporting or not for people. You can identify new opportunities to be able to see where you could actually um, provide products and services in untapped, in untapped areas. And here you see some work that's been done by Algolio and Twilio where they've looked at um, how do they extend their product range for non-profits and make them, uh, their products useful for non-profits. But also from a business point of view, you can see where um, a bank in Spain, for example, has identified that really they want, they can't keep up with things like conversational banking. They can't uh, keep up with offering the whole range of corporate banking opportunities. So then by looking at their open ecosystem and their role in it, they're able to say, okay, we want to have partnerships that are helping us build new products in those areas. Then you can also develop new business models when you've got this idea of what's happening with your um, with your place in the open ecosystem. And here's, for example, we've done some work just looking at one of the um, API aggregator platforms in the payment space, and then we've mapped out who's involved in it, what products are being built. When you do that, you, you might be able to see, okay, we're not really targeting these individual and household products, uh, consumer markets, so we could work there. Or maybe we're seeing huge amount of drive with fintechs then coming through distribution channels. So um, this is really working for us. Let's increase this. So it gives you more insight into where there's those opportunities to develop your relationships and, uh, and address some of the gaps. And then finally, you can solve complex problems. Oh, uh, so that's me. Talk, uh, talked out. The, um, so you can solve complex problems. And here, coming back to that COVID example, we're really seeing how APIs and sharing of data, for example, has, an, has enabled an infrastructure to be able to track variants globally and then be able to respond faster as far as being able to uh, increase uh, and adapt vaccines for the future, be able to uh, address um, uh, where resources need to go. So here you can sort of see that you know, it's it's creating an old API, so at the heart of creating new understandings around how to solve complex problems. Okay, uh, so then I think that's it, Saul. So I hope I've come in on time. Hey, Mark, that's really great, and and bang on time too. <laughs> so um, you've obviously uh, practiced quite a bit. Um, that's a fascinating talk, Mark, and I love the way you've analysed all of those different uh, ecosystems and those great uh, infographics that you've got there. Um, with the open banking one, you mentioned uh, you mentioned the importance of API standards for open banking, and the interesting thing for me was that the European Union didn't actually provide any API standards, whereas in Australia, I think yeah, we we lagged a couple of years. But we learned something from it and we we pretty much started with the standards or we at least had them early in the approach what do you think about the difference in approach between the eu and australia um particularly around the the the, the use of standards to kind of uh, uh grease the uh oil the wheels in the system <laughs> Yeah. So um, there's three things in what you've said that I that come to the heart of this uh, presentation, actually. So first of all, regulation is actually an enabler, an enabler of innovation, especially in open ecosystems. So regulation helps ensure that there are new market opportunities. And we've seen that with open banking. Second thing that you've said, yes, I think Europe got it totally wrong. Like when you look, uh, we've done some analysis of the, of the introduction of new fintech into the open banking ecosystem, UK has got a much higher rate 
of acceleration of fintech coming into uh, their market because there's an API standard that all um, uh, all banks must use to be able to enable fintech to be able to integrate the APIs. You see that with Australia. Brazil's now got um, an open banking regulation. They've taken the Australian and the UK approach where they're uh, building an API standard template, and so all banks have to conform with that. In Europe, we've seen the massive um, growth of one industry segment within open banking, which is the API aggregator platforms, which have taken the role of like having to turn all of the individual banks into a common API so that then fintech can build um, and accelerate their building faster with that. So you can, so there it has enabled some sort of market growth opportunities, but really just that middleware opportunity, not the end products that are coming to consumers but just sort of like a, a, a layer that's trying to reduce that complexity because they didn't have the standards. So they're those first two points. The third point is sort of underlying a lot of the discussion I've been trying to have in this presentation. Um, and that's, I think I'm going to turn this off, aren't I? The, um, uh, so then with that, the um, uh, to, to me, what I'm si saying underneath all of this is that, yes, we're moving to open ecosystems and digital infrastructures, policy has to keep up. So the issue in Europe is they were like, oh, this is policy, so we don't want to talk about technology too specifically, so let's not mention APIs at all. And mm -hmm. let's just, like, leave it, you know, like, let's not be that opinionated. But then when you're not opinionated, then that means that um, you don't get any action or it reintroduces this complexity because everyone interprets the policy differently and implements it in a slightly different way. You know, so I think that policymakers have to actually understand APIs and catch up. You don't have to say this should be a REST API or a GraphQL API, but you need to say let's for interoperability and for ease of, uh, you know, product velocity, all of the good stuff that APIs create, we need to build them on APIs and use API standards, you know. Yeah, so provide, that, provide that's what I'm really way. hopeful for. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, really great to, great to see you again. You're looking good. Um, Cheers.